with Abby Slagel, and I'm honored to introduce you our first speaker, Ms. Star Parker. Star is the founder and president of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, or CARE. She's also a syndicated columnist for Scripps News Service and writes weekly op-eds for more than 300 newspapers, and has authored three books, four books, I believe, one of which is right out there, you should check it out. And she's a regular commentator on a variety of television, radio, and print news outlets. Star's conservative views and policy ideas stem from personal experience with welfare dependency and a refusal to believe that she's a victim of racism. Her inspiring attitude led her to become politically active. As a social policy consultant today, she inspires conversations that lead to urban residents who big government and handouts as the problem instead of the solution, and regularly consults congressmen on more effective methods of urban social change. Just some of her professional accomplishments include speaking at the 1996 Republican National Convention, co-producing a documentary with BBC on affirmative action, serving on the board of the Cato Institute, and being interviewed about her conservative transformation on 2020 Rush Limbaugh, Christianity Today, and World Magazine. She holds a bachelor's degree in marketing and business from Woodbury University, and in 2012, Star received the Clover Loops Policy Institute's Conservative Leadership Award, and this year at CPAC, she received the Reagan Award. Star has lectured at over 180 colleges and universities around the country, and I'm so excited to present her to you today. Please welcome Ms. Star Parker. Thank you. It's good to be with you. I'm so excited about so many women being here, and I'm so glad that Grandma's got so much shout out because I'm a Grandma. And in fact, my grandson, who's 10 years old now, Mr. James, uh, did a stage play that I missed because I now work here in Washington, and they're still in California. Uh, but he was uh, Benjamin Franklin, and they were writing the Constitution. So I told Mr. James, "Well, if you're writing the Constitution, you need to come see the Constitution." And he said, how am I going to see the Constitution, Grandma? Maybe because he's 10 years old, they haven't studied that yet. They were just doing a play. I said, it's right up the street from where Grandma Lee works and where Grandma Lee stays, and she's in Washington, D.C. So this past weekend, uh, Mr. James was here, his little four-year-old sister who tried to rip up the Constitution, uh, and we had to get her out of the archives real quickly, and then her parents uh, were here as well. So I was glad to hear so many grandmas got the shout-out, and it reminds me, that I better be really cool about what I say around <laughs> Mr. James and Miss Naomi uh, so that they don't say, you know, I would say my grandma, but she's in jail. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm glad so many moms got shout outs too because, you know, let my daughter know about that. Uh, when, uh, when I get back, that everybody admires their mom and uh, I think she admires me very well. Uh, she's doing extremely well in her career right now. She's an actress. Uh, that nine to 12 year olds know very well because she's a Disney actress. Uh, I'm glad Joan of Arc got a shout out. Wow, I was like, wow, that's impressive because that's one of my heroes as well. And this year, no, last year now, the last time we go out every year to um, Italy to follow the lives of the saints and the martyrs, uh, Joan of Arc, um, uh, Giuseppe Verdi's Joan of Arc, which is over 100 years old and hadn't been seen in 100 years, was actually on stage. And uh, I thought it was kind of really, I think it was one of the few ladies that had mentioned Joan of Arc. Okay, right here. Yeah, I thought that was kind of cool. And then Mother Teresa, of course, is my favorite. Uh, and I think a lesson that we can all take away, if nothing else today, is something that Mother Teresa tried to drill into those that didn't know of her work, that if you uh, change one, you change the world. You know, you, uh, uh, when we think about one-on-one -on -one relationships, touch one, you've touched all, change one, you've changed the world. And that's what really comes down to the work that we're trying to do, or at least some of us here in Washington, D.C. I do run a policy institute, as was told in my bio, it's called Urban Cure. We, we are changing it to Urban Cure, because if you look up Cure, all kinds of things come up. Um, people might think we're even doctors, and you could say that we're doctors, because we are attempting to stop the hemorrhaging that has been brought on by the welfare state, uh, and try to get people on track, away from destructive behaviors. Uh, we believe that charity belongs to the church, and, and to community, not to government manipulators. So we're trying to get Washington, D.C. and taxpayers out of the charity business and get the church and the community back in. Uh, so we can kind of think that we're doctors, but we're changing over to Urban Cure, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, where we promote market-based solutions to fight poverty. I didn't end up here simply because of, um, of a research or things that I learned in college or with a major desire to do this. Actually, I ended up in Washington, D.C. because I wanted governmental barriers removed. The same barriers that I lived up against when I lived in the welfare state. So I started believing the lies of the left very early in life. Uh, in criminal activity, drug activity, sexual activity. The time that they've allowed me doesn't allow me to get deeply into my testimony 
in and out of abortion clinic after clinic until after the fourth time I had a gut instinct way down deep inside that there must be something wrong with killing your offspring. Ended up still promiscuous, had a child out of marriage and lived on welfare three and a half years consistently, carving just this little dark hole for myself. And it wasn't until after a Christian conversion that I totally changed my mind. Went back to school, got a degree, started a business. And after the 1992 Los Angeles riots destroyed my business, that's when I began to start thinking about social reform and social policy. Because I knew that it wasn't just me stuck in that madness. There were a whole lot of people that were believing the lies of the left, believing that my problems were somebody else's fault, believing that America was inherently racist, believing that I didn't have to mainstream because poor people were poor because wealthy people were wealthy. And those lies are still being told today. So I decided to come out here uh, to DC and not just keep putting out fires, uh, that liberals have set all around the country, uh, but to take away the matches so that people can live free. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I, ha I hesitate every time Michelle and her, her organization invite me and or Young America Foundation because what then begins to happen, they get up here and they encourage you ladies uh, and with, yeah, uh, anyone, all of the men and women to start bringing conservative speakers to your campus. And as was said in my bio, uh, which probably was a little, well, maybe about a year ago, that was at 180 universities, because now I'm at about 192 universities around the country that I've lectured on as a result of the work of Claire Bluthus and Young America Foundation. And almost a few years ago, wanted to write another book called 10 Reasons Not to Send Your Kid to a Secular College Unless You Want an Agnostic to Return Home. Uh, and I didn't pin the book, but I did make a determination. I'm not going on these campuses anymore. These kids are just out of control, and they already know everything. There's nothing I can lend to the discussion. Uh, but I did uh, kind of remove myself from doing a, a few of these types of meetings that would encourage you to bring me to your campus, which I'm still open to do, uh, because it kept happening anyway. And just this past, um, what did we just leave, spring, I did Smith. Like, if I can go to Smith, I know, I know these girls are wickedly out of control. That's why I'm so glad to see so many conservative women that compete with them, because I do believe in competition. I believe your ideas are stronger. I listen to your introductions. Your voices are strong. Your confidence is there. So I'm not afraid of a few people that just decide that they are going to spend their lives trying to destroy capitalism in the country because of you. So I'm really glad to be here. And they asked me to speak on um, breaking the cycle of poverty. Oh, and for those of you that want to dip more into my story, you can look at some of my books. And we have one here, Blind Conceit, uh, which I I'll tell my story in all of my books. And it's 20 bucks, and if you want to get one, uh, my girls will make sure that you do. Uh, but I did want to mention those that want all of the full details of the story that I don't have time to tell today. I did pin my autobiography of years ago. The name is Pimps, Whores, and Welfare Brats. And you won't get all of the detail because of statutes of limitations I didn't want to uh, reveal myself and end up in jail after having my Christian conversion changed in my life. So, but you can gotta, kinda get a glimpse into how um, destructive uh, the left is and the lies of the left. And one of the things I wanna address this morning in talking to you about breaking the cycle of poverty is just where we are in our society uh, and how much more difficult it's going to be now to break the cycle of poverty and government dependency because of where we are as a, as a culture. And in fact, we're at a critical cross point in our land right now, as many of you that are following the political world and some of the information here in Washington, D.C. I've said much lately that we're at a point where we were in the 1850s when Abraham Lincoln opened the scripture and read the words of Jesus Christ himself, that a house divided against, against itself can't stand. We were at that point where he had been closed that book and said, we can't do this anymore. We can no longer be happy with him. So this is, it's just not going to work. We're going to have to make a decision. He did not believe that the union would dissolve, but he knew that we could not be half slave and half free. We had to make a decision to be one or the other. We could no longer be both. And you know, what's fascinating about his little life is, uh, and his opportunity to come here to Washington, D.C. was when he, and, and some of the discussions we're hearing today uh, in the political realm, when he first came, his first inaugural, if you read back through it, he kind of sounded like uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, who gets a lot of criticism by playing by the rules here in Washington, but by the time he had that second inaugural, he sounded like Senator Ted Cruz, because he knew now we can't go on like this anymore. We're going to have to make some really strong decisions about who we're going to be, and we're at that crossroads. You know, unfortunately, the main reason our nation is in the social, the economic, and racial crises that it's in is because 50 years ago, liberal progressives began to use the political process and the courts to promote three cultural wars, a three-part a three cultural war against our American founding principles principles of traditional values. Choice loses its meaning if it doesn't matter what we choose. 
against the values of a limited role of government. The role of government is to protect our interests, not to pursue us, not to plunder us. Principles of free markets. Profit is good. In fact, uh, Steve Forbes argued that profit is so moral that it gives us tomorrow. It is the engine for those jobs that we keep saying that we want created. And then, of course, uh, another founding principle of the pluribus unum. Many became one. The Statue of Liberty, actually. It stands there and letting us know that some of the girls in the room, I think, uh, said that they're now in New York, which I'm going to talk to your mom because I'm surprised she didn't go there. My daughter wanted to go to Boston all the way from LA. I'm like, not on my nine, you want. Uh, you'll, you'll, have to, you'll figure that one out yourself. And she's kind of happy now because she stayed in California and at her college she met her husband. So I remind her all the time that she did mom the best. All along, you can go, go 3,000 miles away, you can still be single, and I wouldn't have to look like it. Uh, but you know, that woman sitting there in, in, in New York is serious. Where she said, bring us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. This is what this country is about, and the diversity is just in this room alone. So as many become one, it's part of this unit, but we've had so much indoctrination over the last 50 years from the left about multiculturalism and, and diversity that now we're, we're vulcanized to where those of you that from California can attest to, uh, our, our, our freeways are jammed up the way that they are because although our street signs are in one language, English language, you can take our test in 40 different languages in California to get your driver's license. There's really something wrong with that. And it's one of the reasons that when people say, well, gosh, that's a long commute for you to live in, L in California. I'm in Orange County, actually. I think somebody who I think was from Orange County, I heard by over to give a shout out to. Um, you know, that uh, they think it's a long commute to come out here. I'm like, uh, the person who thinks it's a long commute has never been on the 405 or the 5 freeway in Southern California. <laughs> It'll take you forever just to get 10 minutes up the street. And mostly because we've gotten who we are and our founding principles have been under attack for the last 50 years. This, uh, this attack, these three cultural wars have spiraled uh, our poor and our most vulnerable into lives of moral chaos and, and government dependency. And after two generations in this matter, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to get us up top of this jam that we place ourselves in, including their own lives. It's an extremely cruel Uncle Sam and his uh, vision for the poor. The rules that I had to live under and welfare are don't work, don't save, don't get married, and we'll kind of keep you enslaved to this poverty plantation. Uh, the first war that the progressives started was this war of religion. Now, these three wars were all started during the same period of time that African Americans who got hit hardest by these wars uh, were, uh, were attempting to get through a civil rights movement that said, let's remove governmental barriers so that man can live free. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sitting over here, uh, if you get a chance to see him, you just go on the other side of the, um, the Korea um, um, Memorial if you haven't been up that way yet, you want to go see that. He was a preacher. He wanted barriers removed. His message was of morality. He wanted revival and repentance. <laughs> this new message of the social justice ites, oh no, they want revenge and redistribution. And so during that same time that we were seeing a, a, a new, whole new people group saying America is so beautiful that we want to live free of her, uh, we had three of these cultural wars. And that form religion in the early 60s, it weakened our public institutions and it opened this door for this culture of corruption. The culture that you're now in firsthand, our nation's capital, where we make our laws that many of your congressmen exempt themselves out of before they pass them on to the rest of the country. Many laws that are inconsistent with the very principles that founded this country. Uh, you can't trust even lawmakers. You can't trust the IRS. You can't trust the TSA. You can't trust the NSA. The list is getting longer and longer. There's something really wrong with that. Well, how did we get here? Well, in those 60s, we scrubbed our schools from all reference to God. In 1962, the Supreme Court struck down school sponsor, a state-sponsored school prayer. And by 1963, the court ruled you couldn't read the Bible or recite the Lord's Prayer in the public schools. The second war that was during the same period of time was this war on marriage. So we're now moving from, we're having a great debate about whether we can even read the Bible or if there's any meaning to, um, to, to, to eternal truths that are listed four times in our Declaration of Independence, we then have this war on marriage. Uh, it weakened women, and it opened this door to this culture of meaninglessness. That feminist movement that erupted during that time was nothing more than the promotion of monism, which is the elimination of gender binary. And now we're starting to see it exhibited full force in this whole new bathroom transgender debate. 
conjugal marriage is the capstone of all humanity, and as a result of this war on marriage, homosexuality is now dividing up and bringing tremendous hostility into the public square. All sexual behaviors, adult behavior, should be private. It should not be something that parents or teachers have to talk to four-year-olds about uh, because of this new public square debate. Abortion? Abortion has deeply hurt us. 60 million dead in 43 years should give us all great pause. But instead, here's where we are. This is a testimony I'm going to read to you that was submitted to the United States Congress by one of my friends and colleagues. Uh, her name is Nate Gardner. And this was after uh, Kermit Gosnell 2013 trial in Philadelphia, as we were still trying, and we're, we were trying then, we're still trying to get penalties in the uh, Federal Born Alive Infants Protection Act. Now, some of you that are working for wonderful Congress, but, oh, excuse me, Congress, it's very cold out of the cold. Wow, every day. I hope you girls brought your umbrellas that are not used to wearing it every day. Uh, it, it, it's 88 degrees outside. Um, the, the Federal Border Life Infants Protection Act of, of 2002 is law. Uh, in fact, it was a voice vote in the Senate. Even Hillary Clinton and Harry Reid voted for it that says if a born, baby is born alive, you can't kill it. But it doesn't have penalties, and we want penalties. And if it had penalties, we probably wouldn't have been seeing cause now. But Dave Gardner, this is the testimony because the Bureau of the Organization of Hope uh, some, had some opportunities to meet with some of the congressmen. Uh, and their staffers to try to get these penalties or get some attention placed on them. And this is what her testimony said. He quote, I cringed and gnashed my teeth while sitting in the almost empty Philadelphia courtroom hearing testimony after testimony of babies screaming and screeching while being killed by Gosnell and his employees. I heard the gruesome testimony by abortion clinic workers about how Gosnell would deliver fully developed viable children and then turn them over and cut their spinal cords. Gosnell even joked about one baby being big enough to walk to the bus stop. Then he cut that little boy's neck and tossed it up. It was no big deal to him to kill these children, to slash their necks as they struggled, as they strained, as they cried. If that wasn't a protest enough, he severed off the feet of several babies and kept them displayed in jars on a shelf as some sort of souvenir. Now I'm going to put a pause there, because if you remember, those of you that do remember, you were a little young, it's been a few years ago, but you are probably just getting into college or coming out of high school and they don't have been paying real close attention. Uh, Kermit Gosnell's abortion clinic, legal abortion clinic in Philadelphia had two rooms for abortion. He had, just in case anyone ever decided they would come by to inspect, although you know, they did come. They had one room for white women and then one room for black women. And he knew because if he knew to do this because he knew that if he were to be inspected, he could show them the room for the white women. And most white women, uh, if they had gone into the horrors of what those black people would see, would probably try to tell because they come from a little bit more um, uh, healthy community life. But when you get into the heart of the heart, uh, and you have black women, uh, he, he had these displays on shelves when they went into their room, sitting in front of them. Imagine the darkness that's in that woman now coming out of that experience with nowhere to go and no one to tell. He had them displayed on the shelf as some sort of souvenir. Testimony goes on, Gosnell stored the bodies of children in milk jugs and large soft drink containers and juice bottles. Forty-seven babies were found in the refrigerator freezer. They had to be thawed out like TV dinner so the coroner could determine their first and last moment of life. Because they were now trying to get him for murder. Uh, and what's really interesting about uh, this freezer is this is the same place the staff had to keep their lunch. Was there a public outcry after these discoveries in Philadelphia? Did our elected officials determine a sense of urgency to investigate the abortion industry to see if there were other Gosnells? I mean, many of you are working on Capitol Hill. might be a question you want to ask your congressman. What, what ever happened to those hearings that we said we were going to have about Kermit Gosnell? Did they pursue a national crisis as a national crisis that poor and vulnerable women all across this country were being maimed and molested and even murdered in the so-called safely over abortion bill? This is happening all across this country. In the name of choice, women are being maimed, molested, murdered. We have data continuously. No. Nope. And in fact, last year, in the face of lots and lots of gruesome videos exposing the new depth of violence the abortion industry has taken, Planned Parenthood is still in business, in taxpayer subsidized abortion business. And they're selling baby body parts. That's where we've gone since the war on marriage started in the 60s, coupled with the war on religion that said there are no absolutes, you determine. 
On top of that war, to start dismantling family life, we had the third war that the liberal progressives started during the same body of time. That was a war on poverty. And this weakened family and opened the door to this cultural entitlement. According to a recent Investor Business Daily report, the nuclear family in 1970, a lot of you weren't here in 1970. I was here in 1970. Your moms might have been here in 1970. So you can kind of think about 1970 back forth. In 1970, 40% of all American households were headed by married couples with children. Okay, 1970, 40% of American households were, 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 were headed by married couples with children. Today, that number is 18%. The single family in 1970, I mean, it might seem very historic for you, but it's not that long ago. This rapidly, we moved from 1970, where only 7% of American children lived with a mother who had never married. In 2014, that number was 48%. We're in a horrible crisis. We're at a crossroads that America has not visited before because even though we've had major challenges, major crimes against humanity like slavery, major opportunities to check who we were up against our declaration and our uh, constitution, family life pretty much stayed intact. And today that life is not intact. And when you don't have family, you have nowhere really to uh, promote values that are consistent with those family documents. The births outside of marriage, the black community, went from 22% out of wedlock birth rates in the, in the 60s to 72% today. The white out of wedlock birth rate in the 60s was at 3%. Today it's 30%, eight points higher than where blacks were in the 60s. And this is why we're starting to see those same pathologies, those social pathologies that we thought were um, only in our hard-hit communities as a result of some of the hard-hit challenges. It's in the middle class because it's connected directly with family life. The Latino, Hispanic, or whatever the politically correct term for this people group is now, uh, there was no data because they weren't a special interest group during the 60s to be politically exploited and manipulated. But since they are today, we have data today. And so that out of my birth rate number is at 53%. Now, you might not think it matters. A lot of libertarians don't think it matters or think it's none of our business. Well, according to Ron Haskins at the Brookings Institution, I didn't hear anyone in from Brookings. I've heard a couple of you at think tanks. Uh, but Brookings is a, it's a very powerful uh, think tank here in Washington, D.C. and does extremely good research, even though that some, they lean a little more center left to my liking. Um, but they do have some helpful uh, people and some uh, data that they collect that you can actually trust. Well, in 2009, this is a year after the economic collapse, uh, in 2009, the poverty rate for children in homes with married parents was 11%. But the poverty rate in homes with, uh, with children that were headed by single mom during that same year was 44.3%. This is according to the Brookings Institution. What we are finding as a result of this management of poverty is it's left wanting with those that need our help the most. Redistribution of wealth is a violation of private property. It's one of the reasons it will never work as a concept. Um, when you think about taking from one and giving it to another, this is not consistent with just the founding of the country, freedom and personal responsibility. But it's inconsistent with the scripture. I mean, a couple of you over here, like Mother Teresa, so I'm assuming that you uh, are followers of the, of the scripture where the Ten Commandments says don't covet. And socialism is rooted in covetousness, where someone has something and other one wants it, so they go hire politicians to take it from them. Now they're violating the Eighth Commandment, too, because it's a theft. Uh, because not a lot of people want their private property confiscated that way. Uh, and don't think it's not a confiscation of private property because the IRS is not sending out letters saying that you'd like to inevitably give this poverty program so people might start market to break their lives. You know, if you don't pay your taxes, you're going to jail. And so you don't have a choice whether you want to participate in what we've done in this war on poverty over the last 50 years, which has invested $22 trillion, $900 billion a year, and we're where we are today. This was so hoping helping those that are most in need. Books shall sag with research and data that demonstrate with crystal clear clarity the relationship between crime to poverty, poverty to a lack of education, lack of education to a lack of work, and lack of work to a lack of family structure. 
consumer. Anyone that says, well, you know, it's none of our business how people do that. Well, then why don't you get out of the family manipulation business here in Washington, D.C.? Because public policy is what is changing public opinion on these matters. And public opinion then starts to move into private behavior lives. And that's why we have now open expression of things that we would have never allowed in the public square even just 50 years ago when this political manipulation started. If you don't want to be born in America, it's really not rocket science. Get educated, get a job, get married before you get pregnant, have children after you're married, save and invest about 10% of your income, give at least 20% away to, to, in your local, 10% to, to your church, 10% to your, pa your personal passion. If you do these things, then your opportunity to be born in America are minuscule, even when you have a fluctuating economy. You know, King Solomon was right, two are better than one. When you have two people trying to pay up on that rent, with that mortgage is a lot easier than one person who has three children. And we as a society have left these communities um, begging for us to give them other types of scenarios so that they don't end up generational trying to now get themselves out. I was recently in Alabama and a couple of teachers walked up to me and they said, oh, so you run a big tag in Washington? I said, yeah. And they said, oh, well, you need to go back and think about this because this is what we're hearing in our country right now. They said, um, yeah, our 14 year old girls are coming in and saying, Mama said, don't get a B on the test. Mama said, bring home a baby. And Mama said, if you don't bring home a baby, you're going under your uncle because you're going to have a baby. This is what three generations of a welfare state have reduced us to as a society who have turned our back on involvement in other people's lives because we figure we just pay that office through our taxes. You know, and the problem is that these poor communities all across America have left these behavioral checkpoints unchecked. And that's why we end up with despair. What ends up happening is we get crime, particularly amongst our youth, who are filled with the energy of life and have no productive way to channel it. And then we get big government. Needs tested welfare programs are costing us dearly. Now today, 53% of all births are paid for by Medicaid. 53% of all births are paid for by Medicaid. This is a scenario that we can't survive. We're going to have to make a decision as a society. We're going to be biblical and true. Or we're going to be second in status, and there's no real middle ground left anymore. And as the 2012 presidential election proved, and as we are now seeing in this George Soros funded Black Lives Matter campaign, having a large, chronically poor portion of your population it not only creates tremendous moral and economic problems for these communities, but for the entire country. And they have a tremendous impact on elections and on public policy. The Great Society has great costs. The federal government now has taken 25% of American economy. An example, in, in 1980, 20% of Americans got more from government than they put in. Okay, in 1980, no, y'all don't hear 82, because my kid is older than all of them. She was born in the 80s. All right, fine, you can remember 80s. Maybe you knew something about the 80s. Actually, they're doing a scene special on the 80s. Uh, Prince is from the 80s, so you know that. Okay, uh oh, I'm trying to really stop. In 1980, 20% of Americans got more from government than they put in. Today, 60% of Americans get more from government than they put in. You guys don't have a real good future in front of you if we're going to continue down this particular road, because when you combine moral relativism with big government, everybody loses their freedom. We are just not free. We're not a free country anymore when judges get to define truth, as we saw most recently under the Supreme Court decision about marriage. And we have a whole lot more things coming down the pipe. And it's one thing to have a discussion about the LG, the G, it's an LGBTQ. Okay, so we have got LG with marriage, we jumped over B, went straight to T with transgender bathrooms. I, I'm wondering when the shoe is dropping on the Bs, what is in store there? We already know what's happening with the Q, because there are already movements throughout all of the states to say change the age of consent. We already know from the 80s in Nampala, that Men Boy Love Association had a motto, sex before eight or it's too late. We're no longer free when, when, when bureaucrats can segment us into different special interest groups based on our race, based on our gender, based on our sexual identity, to pit family against family, friend against friend, neighbor against neighbor, employee against employer, young against old, God-fearing against the godless. You know, we're, we're, you can't even talk to anybody anymore about just basic truth so that others can further these social philosophies that throughout history have proven to reduce mankind to savagery. They think we're being progressive. No, you're going back to cake mandate. 
As, we, as our nation should have learned from both slavery and from Jim Crow, force is not an American ideal. No more than should my neighbor's auto insurance company be forced to cover my tune-ups, than should my health insurance company be forced to cover their sex life. Not their Viagra, not their condoms, not their sex change operations, not their birth control devices, and certainly not their abortions. My point, out of control debt, enslaved for the government, and broken families is not a formula for a great country. We can look into any and every inner city across this country and see what happens when you put together moral relativism in the government. The good news is we can change. The good news is that every part of our country that's untouched by government is going great. I mean, just even this iPhone, uh, it's just incredible. I know my, when, my, when my granddaughter was like two and a half, she actually taught me how to use it, and she downloaded a mini app. I'm like, how do you know how to do that? I don't even know how to do that. Yet. I'm with an Uber. I'm going to make amazing friends at Uber alone because it, where things are free, that gig business is growing tremendously. American entrepreneurship is alive. It's doing really well. Our job is to keep government regulators away from them. Everybody to, outside of Washington that complains against lobbyists, I always tell them, just because you haven't had to hire one yet, they haven't gone after you yet. Believe me, everybody needs a lobbyist. They're like lawyers and doctors. You hate them until you need them. And, uh, and, and, and so we have a lot of the gig businesses now that are hiring big time law firms uh, and, and lobby firms so that they can stay free, so that they can continue to grow great. But where we see big forces of government, we see stagnation. Regarding poverty, it's not an accident that, that black children today are three times more likely to have been born outside of marriage and live in a single parent home than before this war on poverty began in the 60s. The post-civil rights movement answered the black struggle, poor government into it. Government welfare, government schools, government housing, government labor and minimum wage laws, government retirement programs. I mean, that's all you see here in Washington, isn't it? And if it was really funny, if you haven't been over next to um, uh, the, the, welf the welfare office, it's called Health and Human Services here. It's on Independence Avenue. I mean, what a mockery uh, that they would even think to put that office there. Uh, all, all this does, all this government and the lives of the poor does is create more despair. And, and subsidizes and encourages destructive behaviors. Lack of family, lack of tradition, lack of education, and lack of work. Can this change? It has to. It must change. Because the poor more than anyone need help to get their children out of these broken schools, from under these broken health care policies, and housing policies, and retirement policies, and welfare policies. The steps out of poverty aren't rocket science. But you do have to be free to take them. And it's insulting that these progressives stand in the way you're, you're probably meeting some of them and their interns on the left uh, as you're working here in the hill. But they think they know all of the answers. They stand in the way of everything that we, that we know will be able to help transition ourselves out of this chaos that we have created for people that are in need in our society. They stand in the way of school choice vouchers. They stand in the way of housing vouchers. They stand in the way of personal retirement accounts. Three economic measures that will help people get on the path to independence. And there are things that we at CURE are fighting for. And these are things that we focus a lot of time and attention on. And we were actually working with some of this. Even I heard a few of the Congress, of congressional offices in the room uh, that we work with uh, to try to get changes anytime uh, a public policy idea comes up that affects poverty and or welfare. And as one social uh, thinker pointed out, liberal progressives always try to speak on behalf of the health, yet they are the most cruel offenders of their servants. The poor to them are not just takers, like some Republicans might suggest, but worse. The poor to them are acceptors, beggars, dependent peasants, and greedy minorities that should be loyal to Democrats for every left-wing pro-birth control and pro-dependency molded crumb forced to them in the name of social justice. That's how they look at the poor. We have a tremendous opportunity, those of you that are here because of passion, we have a tremendous opportunity to turn things around, even if it's just in your daily conversations with people that believe that way. You know, they usually have the interns doing little stuff in other paperwork and, and, and a few other uh, things that you might think are not important. Uh, Apostle Paul told us that every part is important. Every single component of getting the right ideas to law so that people can live free are important. And I want to know how much we appreciate you coming from all over the country to intern in these offices. Because change in public policy is what we do here. Now, I know there's a whole lot of talk out there in the society today that we get nothing done uh, in Washington, D.C. And you know, some of them just woke up yesterday and found out the state of affairs and what our government's been doing and wondering why we're 18 
$1.5 trillion in debt, uh, and they want to burn the whole house down. Well, we can't burn the whole house down. You know, we're going to have to fix this problem one policy at a time. And that's one of the things that we try to do through CURE, through our clergy program, our media program, our public policy program, and we have an internship program, uh, because we know that the game will change when we have African Americans that are pushing up against uh, these, these ideas of the left and starting to promote ideas of market-based solutions to fight poverty. I'm going to close with a recent quote that I saw in the Forbes magazine. It said, never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. That's what we have to do, build new models. Your new energy, your conservative women, you have great futures in front of you. Every generation, including your generation, should do everything you can to keep America free. And I was talking to some ladies earlier, sometimes that just even includes getting married and having a whole lot of kids so we can outnumber the enemy. Uh, that's a good profession too, don't worry about it. If that's your dream, I don't want to go out and save the world. That does save the world, and especially if you bring up people uh, like my little grandson who now is playing in Franklin and wants to see the Constitution. Uh, and you're doing it not just for my generation or the next generation, you're doing it for you. You're doing it for what our founding principles are about. It's the least that we can do for each other for the Lord and for America's future. So I want to thank you. I want to encourage you for being here. I want to encourage you to absorb everything that you can. Uh, there is a steakhouse on every corner. Don't absorb too much there uh, because you might go back home and folks might not recognize you much. But, uh, but you do want to take advantage of all that you can hear and experience right here in their nation's capital because one day God may send you here to be here permanently to go then. Not just touch one, to touch all, but to change one, to change the world. Thank you. trying to get to my buzzer so that I can leave 15 minutes for Q&A, but instead I have five minutes for Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, I'll take that. Star, thank you so much for your speech. This is something I'm really passionate about, and um, I did some research this past semester about capitalism, poverty, and Christian charity, and a statistic I came across was that Christians are only giving about 2% of what we have instead of the 10% which you mentioned. In addition to the really important market solutions to poverty, what ways can we encourage Christians to be giving more to private charities to really show the left that um, Private charity uh, does better for long-term solutions than government does. Oh, I love that question. Um, and, and you're right. It's, it's unfortunate that people don't give uh, to the levels that God has asked. Uh, uh, and there are many organizations that are not focusing time and attention on that. The one that comes to mind immediately is, um, we did that gospel page, and what is the name of that group? Oh, it'll come to me in a little bit. But, um, but what, there are two things I want to point out. One is that, um, we don't want to beat ourselves up too bad because while Christian you know, and the left will say, well, they're not going to do that work. No, actually, it's the decent people in quiet communities that are doing the most amazing work. Is it a small portion of that community? Oh, absolutely. But is this the Christian that gets up after Sunday morning, going to church, and send their kids to school on Monday, but then gets up and volunteers in our crisis pregnancy centers, but then gets up and goes into our homeless shelters and volunteers, and they use their time and their talent and their resources to help? Over and above that $900 billion that the government confiscates from this society to throw into that cesspool of a welfare state where only 20 cents on a dollar actually reaches the household, it is a Christian that then gives over and above that in this country $400 billion, and then over and above that $300 billion abroad. So we don't want to minimize that 2% too much. But now let's get to how do we increase it because we do need to. This is an excellent question because it's a, uh, the answer is actually part of a five-point plan that we have come up with through CURE uh, that we're trying to work with uh, now Speaker uh, Paul Ryan on his um, anti-poverty plans to block grant now 11 programs to the states. He wants to take that tr almost trillion dollars that we're uh, manipulating here in Washington and give the states more, more flexibility uh, to come up with programs that will really help transmission people out of government dependency and get their lives on a, on a pathway that, where they have dignity and they can control it. And that is a charity tax credit. What we want is instead of 
tax was coming through Washington, D.C., that dollar for dollar tax credits in a local charity in a certain zip code near you um, gets back the source. Uh, what we're hoping will happen if we can ever get that in law is that then, when people know that I can get money up the street, even in a community I may not have gone to, um, uh, I, I one day might visit that charity as opposed to sending that money to Washington, especially if they can get the tax credit, uh, dollar for dollar tax credit. You know, it's a it's a difficult ask um, for people to do what um, they're not accustomed to doing, which is going into communities that are they're, that they're uncomfortable. But one of the reasons that I like visiting the monuments, and those of you that haven't had an opportunity to do that yet, we really need to right there in a row when you look at Vietnam, which they're not even called Vietnam anymore, the wars of the South Pacific. Abraham Lincoln that drew the line in the sand to say what kind of country we're going to be. On the other side, you have the Korea Memorial, where every, their faces are in anguish. They have all of their gear on their back. Uh, and uh, they have on the wall, freedom is not free. But the plaque in front of it, where Koreans from all over the world come in uh, to see through their memorial opportunities, uh, it says that we did this as Americans for a land we never visited and a people we never knew. And that's what we have to start thinking about when we ask questions of charity. We have, we have to think about now in our country, a land we've not visited. It's one thing to move out the suburbs and say, I hope it doesn't come near me. Um, and the people, they have changed. What used to be the face of poverty in our country was just because you were one generation from economic freedom because you had a good family. And that family would then pass on those values and you would build up a little bit more. You would collapse that part of our society. So it's going to take that extra effort uh, and we think that we can do that by changing public policy when it comes to um, charity tax credits. Do you have one more question? Um, oh, there's a question over here. This young lady, now we finally finish up. I think I, yeah, because, is there other speaker here? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay, one more question. Hi, thank you so much for that very informative and inspiring speech. Um, you talk about how, you know, it takes one, one thing to make a difference, and, you know, the quote you said at the end, what you were saying, um, I was wondering, you know, I go to a very liberal university. Which one do you go to there? Syracuse University. Oh, so it, it'll be a miracle when I graduate as a Republican. I think I'm going to put that on my cap. Um, <laughs> but what I was wondering is how, you know, I really like to engage in these types of conversations with people and try and promote free markets and policy that's going to get people out of the dependency culture. Um, but when you try and have these conversations with people, you know, you're immediately invalidated as a sexist or a racist or whatever you know, label they, they want to give you. You know, you have had the tremendous personal experience, you know, as an African-American woman in that system that has given you a platform to talk about these issues. Um, you know, as a white woman, you know, I feel it's very difficult to talk about these somewhat touchy issues that get into racial tensions. What do you suggest is the best way that we can really open up um, a good dialogue? I'll uh, just be honest, just admit, yep, you're right. I've never experienced it. Nope, I've got privilege. Yeah, I don't understand why though you would tell your people that they're victims and they're poor. Nope, help me understand. You're right. I cannot uh, on a personal level. Yeah, they're just challenged. There are some positions and they're uh, just as in fact one of my friends. He was a uh, the they actually became labor uh, chair in, in Chile when they reformed um, Social Security. In fact, he was the instrument to do that. He actually asked me one day. He's like, I. I don't understand what life is. Why do black people tell their children they're poor? So that is just so insulting. Why in the world would somebody want their kid to grow up with that heavy burden on them? And who tells their kid they're poor? So yeah, I would just break it down to questions. But another thing I would do is what um, Michelle asked of all of you to do is consider bringing conservatives to your campus. It doesn't have to be combative, but you can have a dialogue. Well, hopefully they let you. I doubt it. But um, about these issues, just by doing panel discussions. You know, there'll be those in the room that will just want to shout down, uh, but there will be those in the room that will want to hear, uh, and then you can get creative about it. I remember, um, I think it was last fall, maybe fall before that, I was over at UCLA, uh, and uh, what those kids did was really creative. They, they uh, did it during lunch hour, and they brought in um, Chick-fil-A and told the kids that they passed out the flyers. They didn't do anything combative. They didn't use you know, um, firm action language and all these other things that'll bring out just the ilk and everybody else to stay away. They actually just said, we're gonna just talk about poverty. And so you had all these people that are in social work and other places that say, ooh, free food, and we're gonna talk about poverty? Sure, it's food, overpacked. And what was really fascinating was it was overpacked with Asians. 
and others who are concerned about these issues because they're coming from countries that uh, don't have the kind of freedom that they uh, think that we have and that they would like for us to preserve because now they're Americans and they want children here. Uh, they want their children to be Americans. So it's overwhelming. So it overwhelmed that hard left that wants to shut you down uh, and then it, and then the few little you know, Republican students that hosted me there didn't have as much fear uh, because of uh, what could have happened uh, as a result of them hosting that kind of panel. So what you want to do is just get creative about how you're going to bring these issues up because we cannot run from them. What the left has cleverly uh, done, uh, because they know that people don't like contention, generally speaking, is shuts down with just a few words. You're racist, you're sexist, you're a bigot. And that's it. And then the dialogue stops. Really? That is not fair for that 14-year-old that has been conditioned to go into her teacher and say, I can't get a B. I got to bring home a baby. Because if I don't bring home a baby, I got to go under my uncle. Because mama said I got to have a baby. We've got to stop this. So we have to confront the left. Thank you so much, ladies. <laughs>